Well, the good news is this video should, and I say should because you never quite know, but this video should have less background noise than the Seattle episode that was uploaded alongside it. The Seattle episode was recorded earlier today when my entire neighborhood decided, hey, let's just be loud as hell to annoy this one person. And boy, boy, did they. But that said, this episode's being recorded at a normal time, which is much, much later. The only thing you might hear in the background is Emmy either chewing on a bone or barking at a squirrel, potentially. We'll see what happens. She's a real wild card, that doggo of mine. That said, hello, welcome to another episode of my Ottawa Senators franchise mode series right here on NHL 18. And today, we continue on with the 2020-2021 season. It is currently March 2nd. It's deadline day, and the question is, are we going to make any moves? Is it the right time to make a few moves? We're five points back of Tampa. They have two games at hand, but we are right there in the middle of one hell of a playoff race. And really, when you look at the team, here's the thing. We're in a much better position than we ever really imagined we would be in terms of the curveball known as acquiring Henrik Borgstrom. The curveball known as acquiring Barzal. Didn't expect to get Fiala and Montour. You look at the Mike Hoffman trade, we end up with Tyson Jost. This team isn't exactly what we expected it to be. That said, what this team is currently is a cup contender. The good thing is, along with this lineup, we have some decent depth, whether that be Nick Paul on defense, Shea, and Milan in the case of injury, and of course, down in the AHL, there's a couple of other players as well. Casey Sezikis, though, goes down to injury. He would have been another player that we could have named. This team is set up incredibly well, and for that reason, I think we're just going to go for it. We are going to sim through the rest of the regular season and more than likely sim through the first round matchup unless somehow, and that's right, I'm going to say it. I'm going to put this negative thought out there. Maybe, just maybe, we miss the playoffs. And if we do, we'll go through the draft. But that said, this is the lineup that we will be moving forward with. It is Borgstrom Barzal, who has been switched back to a playmaker, and Nikita Gusev, second line of Tyson Jost, Colin White, and Mark Stone. Fiala, Duchesne, and Ronning will be the third line. Smith, Brown, and Gagne on the fourth line. Defensively, it's the same. It's arguably our weakest spot, but there's really not a whole hell of a lot more we could do to add to it. Aside from, you know, getting another top four defenseman or even a top two defenseman and dropping Shabbat down. We'd have to drop somebody down, probably Montour to the third pairing. And actually, now that I say that, it might not be the worst idea to at least take a look. And then, of course, the goaltending is just Yorkin and Skinner. Is it the greatest goaltending tandem we've ever had? No, but we have seen teams with less succeed in this game, so you never quite know, but you know what, let's take a quick look, shall we, at what is potentially available around the league, forward depth, I feel like we have it in spades, defensive depth is the one question, so like I said, because of the additions of Barzal and Borgstrom, why not go for it, and here are two prime examples of additions that could be made, however, neither is on a one-year contract, so no, thank you. If we were to get anybody, it would be a pure rental. And Kyle Quincy is not quite the player that I'm looking at. However, Hamannick's hurt. Two years, Dougie Hamilton. I can't afford that rental. There's no way. That is way too much and way too expensive. You have Giordano at an 82 now at this point. Is he really worth picking up? Not really. I mean, he's just going to sit on the bench, so we might as well leave. Well, Lannon and Shea with that job. McDonald, same thing, not good enough. So uh, a Dougie Hamilton type would be tremendous. It just has to make sense. And it's not looking like that's going to be the case. But again, we'll just quickly scroll through these teams. We'll see what we have. And hey, if there's nothing, then cool. 
to the end of the regular season we go, and hopefully onward to our first round matchup. Andre Sakara's there, Tanner Pearson and Alec Martinez. Nobody that great, aside from Dougie Hamilton, which in terms of a rental, although Ryan Ellis. Ryan Ellis of the Nashville Predators is an option. There's also Kevin Shattenkirk and Tyler Myers, more so Kevin Shattenkirk. So Nashville and New York, two teams that we could possibly work out a deal with depending on some of the values of players that we have, and that looks to be it. Washington, Ovi is on the block. That's insane. Matt Niskanen is there as well. One year left, but not that big of a rental. If we're going for a rental, we're going for a rental. And let's let's talk to uh, let's talk to Nashville about Ryan Ellis. I prefer to get Ellis simply because if we send a prospect back or two, it's to the Western Conference, so we wouldn't have to worry about it. We know our first round pick doesn't have that much value. Unfortunately, we don't have our first round pick. We have Winnipeg, Edmonton's, and Pittsburgh's, which could be useful. The big question is the value and difference. I really don't want to give up a Ty Smith in this deal. And Albrecht could work. I'm just double-checking to see if this is even worth it for me. It would take giving up somebody like a Kotkaniemi or a Peyton Krebs. You know, this could work. So say we give up uh, not Doug Waits kid. I also go back over to defense. We give up Albrecht, who, I mean, Albrecht could be half-decent. Christoph Albrecht could be a pretty good defenseman for a sixth round pick. He was a good pickup. I mean, starting with those two, obviously, it won't go through. But here, who did we have? We had Edmonton. The draft picks that we have. Edmonton, Pittsburgh, and I forget who else. Winnipeg. How are these teams doing? Let's see. Edmonton is okay. It's not going to be the highest draft pick. Pittsburgh is great. And Winnipeg is also pretty good. We could easily give up that Pittsburgh pick. I mean, it has some value, of course, but not the most value. And to get Ryan Ellis into this lineup right now would be pretty big for us. We can afford him, which is ridiculous in terms of how the cap has worked out. Let's add that Pittsburgh pick. So the Pittsburgh first, not Doug Waits kid, and Christoph Albrecht. That's decent. I mean, Albrecht might make it. Who knows what the first round pick would become. That's a fair price. For a rental, I just want to see if we can even out the value a little bit. That's going to be way too much. What about a third round pick next year? Just to balance it out a bit. Still no, that's okay. You know me, I have to make sure, I have to make sure that we're getting a fair deal. The AI loves to rip you off. I don't like the AI to be able to walk away thinking they actually won the trade. Was a fifth rounder enough? No. Well, at this point, you know what? Seventh round pick. Make me feel like I've won something. But the Pittsburgh first, Albrecht, and wait for Ryan Ellis in a seventh. I'm good with that. Are the Predators? Yes, they are. Let's do it. Let's bring in a little bit more defensive depth. If you didn't know, now you know. We're going for it this year. With the team we have, the way the cap situation is, it makes all the sense in the world to just go for it so let's do it well Lannon was sent down he cleared waivers that's fine not that I want Timmons or foot to be scratched and to be honest I mean they've both been good they've both been really good but if someone has to get dropped I feel like it has to be Timmons which is a damn shame but we need to go out of our way to be competitive this year so with that said, as far as the Lions go, the only thing that we really have to do is just outright replace Connor Timmons with Ryan Ellis, at least for now, right? And we could, we could drop Dobson or Montour. Like I said, I thought there might be a chance of giving up Montour, but even for a Dougie Hamilton type, it didn't make much sense. Although getting Dougie Hamilton would be tremendous, but at this point, not going to happen. So let's go, I mean, do we go with Ellis and Foote? That could be a decent little pairing there. You know what, let's give it a shot. Let's just outright replace Timmons 
with Ryan Ellis to start. And we'll see how that goes. So the defense has been improved. The forward lines have been updated. Let the simming begin. We have the month of March and a little bit into April to see what we can do. It's a busy month ahead. We're beyond the deadline. We have depth. We have an extremely strong squad. Kravtsov wasn't fully injured to begin with, so we don't have to worry about that. This team has no excuse to fail. This team has no excuse to come up short. That said, crazier things have happened. Better teams have fallen short. So I am a little bit anxious to see what's going to happen as we can take out Seth Griffith for Casey Sezikis. Just to get him back in the lineup and to keep him warmed up and ready to go in case we need him due to injury. I mean, Nick Paul is the first guy that gets into the lineup. But worst comes to worst, we do have Sezikis. So, overall, a decent start to the month. Losses to Dallas and Florida. But we're looking okay now at 42 wins on the year. Let's go ahead and sim another week or so. Eight days to be exact. The big Western road trip wins over. Anaheim and Edmonton, we lose to Nashville 4-1, and that's followed up with a loss to Carolina. So we still have a winning record on the month, but we need to finish strong here. We have five games in April before the regular season ends, four games here. We're at home against New Jersey. Before we hit the road, it's Detroit and Toronto, and then we play Columbus at home. We need to win the majority of these as Matt Duchesne goes down to a shoulder injury. And he is out until April 1st. Not ideal. But you know what? I'm going to just leave Nick Paul in on the third line. If I were to edit lines, I'd simply call up Logan Brown, but we should be okay. We've won two games. Can we at least make it three? Duchesne is back. Paul can somewhat play center as well, so it made sense to allow him into the lineup. Let's see, can we get this big win against Columbus? We cannot. We split those games. Let's sim to April 1st. We're playing Montreal, Boston, New York, Toronto, and Pittsburgh to end the season. As far as the standings go, we currently find ourselves in third place in the division. Two points back of Tampa, tied with Boston. However, both of those teams have a game at hand. We should be safe. We should be. Five games left, 96 points. It's all but a given that we're going to make it. And again, it's risky to say. If you believe in if you believe in jinxing it, I probably just did. We should be okay. It's just now a matter of winning these games down the stretch to secure our spot. Three games against Atlantic teams. This Montreal game is huge, but that game against Boston is especially important so let's go Montreal it's a 3-1 loss Boston it's a 3-2 win so not ideal we're continuing to split these games playing 500 hockey not quite ideal a 50 win season is still on the table taking a look at the standings there you go it is official the Ottawa Senators are in the playoffs and we still have a chance we're one point back of Tampa two points back of Boston, all of us have played 79 games. So three left. Let's do this. We can do this. I know we can. Three games left. We're playing the Rangers, 35-win team. This needs to be a W, and it's not. Say goodbye to the division title. If we want home ice advantage, this game against Toronto has to be a win. And it is. That brings us to the last day of the season. We're playing the 50-win Penguins. So you know what? At the very least, we made the right choice to get rid of that pick. Our chance for the title is gone. Tampa can still win it, but I don't believe we can jump Boston. So we need Boston to win and Tampa to lose, and we need to beat Pittsburgh. We'll get home ice advantage against Tampa. It's still not a guarantee who we're playing but we are making the postseason, and that's what matters the most. So here we go. Simming this game against Pittsburgh. Can we get the win? Yes, we can. 4-2 final. The question is, who is it going to be? Tampa or Boston? And it's Tampa. They beat us by one point, mainly due to the pity point. We will be playing the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round. The Bruins win the division 
let's take a look at the season that was before getting into this first round matchup. We are simming this first round matchup against Tampa right here and right now. Borgstrom led this team in points, 27 goals, 47 assists, a new career high for him. What a season, what an acquisition he proved to be. Matt Barzal, 39 points in 58 games is okay. It's not great for someone of his talents, though, when you see what he is capable of, especially the year before he came here. So hopefully he can get it together for the postseason. Nikita Gusev, 42 goals, 25 assists, a new career high with 67 points. He may have led the NHL in goals. Craziness. What a season for him. Tyson Jost on the second line, a new career high with 57 points, 29 goals, 28 assists. Colin White, the center of that line from the deadline onward, 23 goals, 26 assists, 49 points, 23 goals, a career high, 49 points, a career high, a great season for Colin White. Mark Stone had a really good season, not a career high, but 55 points, 21 goals, I'm okay with that for someone who isn't expected to be that point-a-game guy. Yes, he's a top-line guy. The attribute-wise, he should be capable of it. But I, I don't expect that from him with him being so defensively oriented. 50 points or more, that's good for Mark Stone. Kevin Fiala on the third line, somewhat recovered from a slow start to the season. 41 points in 82 games, not ideal. Only 8 goals compared to the 18 last year. Not sure what's up with that. More than likely it will be his final season here. Matt Duchesne, 9 goals, 25 assists. Same thing. Will it be his final season here? 34 points total in 63 games played. May have broken 40 had he not missed time due to injury. Ty Ronning had a tremendous season. 48 points, a new career high. Of course, he played his rookie season last year. In his sophomore year, he only got better. Those numbers... Considering he's a bottom six guy, very impressive. Zach Smith, nine goals and 19 assists, 28 points. So a great season for Smith. Logan Brown, though, the future that he has here in Ottawa, for me, is looking bleak. 18 points. He's just not a massive point getter. As long as he's listed as a third line guy, I suppose it's worth keeping him just because he is a well-rounded player. But he's never going to be that big point guy for us. That brings us to Gabriel Gagne. 21 points. You know, spectacular numbers for him. His first full season here in Ottawa. I'll take that. 21 points is not too shabby. Defensively, Thomas Shabbat. Six goals, seven assists. Obviously, we're not expecting much offensive production from these players. He was a plus five. But, of course, the numbers were down. The plus minus is perhaps the most important thing. Eric Carlson with 60 Four points this season. A nice return to form for him. He was also a plus six. Brings us over to Noah Dobson. A plus nine with ten points on the year in his rookie season. We also have Brandon Montour. Nine points and a plus one this year. Cal Foote. Five points, four goals. Only one assist all year. That's so unlikely. But a plus 18 on the year in his rookie season. And, of course, we brought over Ryan Ellis. Seven goals, nine assists, a minus one. So it might be worth changing things up a little bit. It might be. I have to wonder, how would a youth line of Dobson and Foot do? Can't help but wonder. And maybe just put the more of the veteran line of Montour and Ellis together. I have a feeling that would do very well. Didn't mean to hit start there, but that's okay. Let's go take a look at the goaltending. Shest Yorkin finishes the season with 77 games played. So the auto rotate didn't kick in all that much. 43 wins, a 926 save percentage, 228 GAA with seven shutouts. 13 appearances for Stuart Skinner. Seven wins, a 921 save percentage, a 2.3 GAA with one shutout. So the goaltending has been pretty damn good this year, this team has been pretty damn good. I feel like that's an understatement. We know that we're playing Tampa in the first round. Let's quickly take a look at a few other stats, mainly around the league, before looking at Tampa's lineup. 
So actually here, just to get you a look. So in the Metro, it's Philly, Pittsburgh, Columbus, and Carolina. In the Atlantic, Boston, Tampa, Ottawa, and Florida. In the Central, Minnesota, Colorado, Dallas, Winnipeg, and Nashville. And in the Pacific, Vancouver, Vegas, and San Jose. So the Philadelphia Flyers just walk away with the President's Trophy. In terms of goals, or goals for per game, we were third in the league at a 2.87. Goals against at a 2.43, just outside the bottom 10 in the league. Our power play percentage was at a fairly strong 20.7%, tied for fourth place in the NHL. As the dog goes on the move, which means you know what it's time for, a jump cut. All right, we're back. We're good. Let's continue onward. Got to get back into my train of thought. The penalty kill at an 82 0.9%, not terrible, but not tremendous either. And that is that. We walk into the postseason on, actually, what was our record in our last 10? 5-5. Five and five. Not ideal. Not the type of stretch that you want to walk into the playoffs with, but I suppose it could have been worse. It, I mean, hell, we could have missed the postseason. Quickly want to take a look at the AHL scoring. Kraft's off as a monster. 84 points in 82 games. He and Gersich... Indeed, tore the league to shreds, to shreds you say, as I thought they might have. Let's take a look here around the league. Taylor Hall led the league in points with 86. So that was it. That's all it took to lead the NHL in points this year. 86 points for Hall. The goal-scoring king, though, was Nikita Gusev, one of two players to break 40 goals. He and Patrick Laine. Nikita Gusev, when is the last time... I had a player in one of my series lead the NHL in goals. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> so that's a nice change of pace. Jamie Ben with the best, plus minus. Juleson with the worst. Here he comes, Mr. Dotchin. I knew it. Of course. Of course it was. Every series. Jake Dotchin, the ultimate goon. So take a look. Time on ice. The NHL's Iron Man, Oscar Clefbaum. Try to get a look at who's won the Selkie. Face-offs go... Two Taves, just so you get a look at what Pedersen's become. The hits belong to Noah Hannafin. The blocks to Murray. Giveaways, Nick Haig, and takeaways, McKinnon. Hmm, I'm actually intrigued to see who wins the Selkie. Part of me thinks it could be Pedersen. He was up there for faceoffs and takeaways. I'll be intrigued to see who wins the Selkie this year. And, of course, Jake Dotchin led the way in fights. Are we going to have anyone that wants to drop the gloves to Jake Dodgson? Is Jake Dodgson going to be in Tampa's lineup? That is a very good question you just asked. Well, let's find out, shall we? Let's take a look at what we're up against in the first round, shall we? This is the team, and of course the good thing is we'll be able to see the regular season stats. So we have the top line of Andre Palat, 17 goals, 39 assists, centered by Steven Stamkos. 26 and 43 for the now 31 year old centerman and Nikita Kucherov 28 goals 45 helpers and 93 overall that top line is still exactly what you would expect them to be second line Alex Kaloran had an okay season 15 goals 24 assists Braden Point 14 goals 25 assists a little bit lower than what you'd expect for him as you get a look at his attributes and Tyler Johnson 14 and 28 so not a bad effort from the second line. Third line, Adam Ernie with 24 points. Anthony Sorelli did very well. So a great season there for Sorelli. And Taylor Radish, 13 goals, 11 helpers. The fourth line, we have Barack McGinn, 9 and 15, a plus 15 on the year. Miku Koivu. Miku Koivu is their fourth line center, which is just such a weird thing to see. Him outside of Minnesota, 12 goals. 22 assists, and Matthew Joseph rounds out the order. On defense, oh boy. Top pairing of Victor Hedman and Ryan McDonough. So they kept Ryan McDonough there. It's the last year of his deal. Second pairing, though, it gets to be a little bit weaker. We have Slater Cuckoo with Anton Strawman down to an 81 overall. So he is regressing fairly quickly. And Eric Cernok will be with Jake Dodgson. So indeed... Dotchin is in the lineup. The goaltender is Andre Vasilevsky. 
929 save percentage in 64 appearances. Cam Ward, the backup, put up Cam Ward numbers. In terms of healthy scratches or injuries, Dominic Massine and Dennis Yan are healthy scratches. Mikhail Sturgachev currently finds himself on the injured list. What for is my question. How serious of an injury are we talking? Not that I wish anyone, you know, injury on anybody, really. But it could be extremely beneficial for if he's if he's out long term. A broken rib. He's out until April 23rd. So technically, we could finish this series before he returns, which would be extremely beneficial for us. But here we go. The confirmation that we are playing the Lightning in round one. They have home ice advantage. It's Boston, Carolina, Philadelphia, and Florida. And I didn't see the other matchup. Pittsburgh, Columbus, and the West. Vancouver, Winnipeg, Minnesota, Nashville, Vegas, San Jose, Colorado, and Dallas. Now, as far as this team goes, I don't think I want to change anything. We're going for it. We are going for it. This team, at the end of the day, is good enough to compete. Whether or not they can do so, well, it's time to sink or swim. That's all I can say. It is time to sink or swim. So let's do this and accidentally hit the wrong button. That's good. That's always that's always nice when I hit the wrong button. <laughs> it's just lovely. The calendar used to be over there. Damn it, I'm an old man who remembers when the calendar used to be on one side of the screen and not the other. We know what the team looks like. We understand the circumstances. Here we go. The first round of the playoffs taking on Tampa. Game one. First period. And that is the best start that this team could have hoped for. Henrik Borgstrom. And just under three minutes later, Mark Stone. With the goals, 2 nothing sends at the end of the first period. We outshot them 12-4. to A dominant effort. I do say so myself. However, maybe, just maybe, this will replicate real life a little bit. We have seen it in a few series now. Tampa happens to get off to a slow start at home when starting a series on occasion. We need to make sure that we get the job done here. We're only a third of the way there. So second period, can we do what needs to be done? Can we get more insurance Yes, we can, and more importantly, we kept them off the scoreboard. Tyson Joe's two minutes and one second into the period. Three nothing sends, despite the fact we are tied in shots at 18 apiece. Uh, let's begin the third period, Sim. We are in the perfect situation. Tyson Jost makes it four. Matt Duchesne makes it five. Oh my god, Vasilevsky's falling apart. The Colorado connection, Gabriel Gagne on the fourth line made it six. Stamco stops the bleeding, but only for a few moments. Thomas Shabbat makes it seven. Gagne makes it eight. An offensive explosion for the Ottawa Senators. Eight to one final on the road to begin this series. What a game and what an effort. Borgstrom, Stone, Jost, Jost again, Duchesne, Gagne, Shabbat, and Gagne again. What an effort from Gabriel Gagne on the fourth line. A five-goal third period. And the Ottawa Senators take a 1-0 series lead. A three-point night for Stone and Jost. Gagne with the two goals. What an effort. From this team, what a way to start off a series. That is incredible. As only three Sens players went without a point, Dobson, Ellis, and Cal Foot. All three were plus players. Ellis was a plus four, despite the lack of a point. That is insane. Gagne had the fewest ice time. Uh, the uh, Yeah, the, the fewest uh, fewest amount of minutes. He had the lowest ice time. Ice Time, that would be the way to phrase it. That's okay. You know, that's fine. If, <laughs> if you're playing uh, Toogie Bingo at home, there you go. Uh, mistaking words, you can check that space. That's almost a gimme space, though, on most occasions. But not today. Not today. Took four shots, had two goals. What an effort from Gagne. What an effort from this team. 
Again, it's the perfect way to start off a series. Uh, not to mention, the Belleville Sens, playing the Utica Comets in round one, lost 2-1 to one in overtime, but have rebounded with a 3-0 win in game two over the Comets. We'll keep an eye out on that series, but it's hardly our focus. Game two in Tampa. Now that is our focus. So let's do this. Let's get the show on the road. Can we continue from where we left off in game one? First period of game two, and Tampa strikes back. Kucherov with the opening goal. Duchesne ties it late in the period, but with a minute and 33 to go, Tyler Johnson restores the lead. 16 shots to six for the Lightning. It's a 2-1 lead at the end of the opening 20. Second period, can we bounce back? Yes, we can, and it's tied at three. Brock McGinn made it three to one. Mark Stone goes off in the second period. He scores just a few moments or a few minutes after Brock McGinn, and then with 1.46 to go in the period, he has tied it. So again, goals from Duchesne and Stone. It's all tied up at three apiece. It's anybody's game. Let's go. Let's get this third period Underway, an early power play chance. Nikita Gusev strikes, and we're still on the power play. And Ty Ronning makes it five. We have another power play opportunity, but what an effort there! Colin White makes it six. They cannot stop this offense. What a display from the Sens on the road to begin this series. Absolutely insane. Fourteen goals. Over the opening two games with no empty netters. What an effort. Down 2-1 to one at the end of the first. Duchesne with the goal. Second period. Stone leads the way with two goals to tie it at three. And then third period. All sends. Two power play goals. Gusev and Ronning. And then Colin White with the dagger. Six to three final. And we are going home. We're going back to Ottawa with a 2-0 series lead. Mark Stone, again, your first star with a three-point night. Eric Carlson with a four-point night. And Colin White with a two-point night as well. No respect for Eric Carlson. What the hell, EA? Four-point night. Now, we had multiple other players uh, who walked away without a point, including Henrik Borgstrom, who did not have that good of a game. On the flip side, though, Eric Carlson, what a guy, leading the way. The captain makes it happen, which makes me wonder, our power play efficiency. We had to have had a few power play goals there. That's the only way. Let's take a look here. So, first period. Actually, okay, so no power play goal there for Duchesne. Second period at 4-13. and 13. Wouldn't expect a power play goal there either. Third period, though. It was a double minor high-sticking call on Koivu, then a minor penalty on Radish and a fighting major, Dotchin and Stone, not too long thereafter. So Tampa gets into penalty trouble. Gusev and Ronning make them pay for it. And yet again, I'll say it loud, I'll say it proud, that, oh boy, that sucks. But we have a 2-0 series lead. Kevin Fiala goes down to injury for the next month with bruised ribs. How bruised are we talking that you're going to be out for a month? That is going to be a rough injury to deal with. We do have Nick Paul, thankfully, but still not ideal. So the fourth line at this point is going to go back to Paul, Smith, and Gagne. Logan Brown will go back to the third line. However, he'll play on the left. We'll have Duchesne at center. And that way, these lines can stay the same. Defensively, how's Shabbat done with Carlson? He's a plus three. Ellis is a four still. Montour is a five. So let's reunite these lines. Although, we have to take out Timmons for foot. Actually, how's foot done so far? Yeah, he's a plus one. We'll keep Cal in there. Power play-wise is where it's going to get just a little bit crazy. Just a little bit, though. Only, only slightly. All right, only slightly. 
So let's take a look here. I want to bring in Colin White. So we have Duchesne. We have... Uh, so wait, hold on. We have Jost. We have White. We have Stone. I'm going to bring in Duchesne and Ronning. And to be honest, i got to bring Ryan Ellis back in. Normally, I'd have Fiala here as well, and we'd run with, you know, all but one defenseman. Basically, Eric Carlson would be the only defenseman. Uh, but this time, we'll have Ryan Ellis in. So, in terms of lefties, let's switch this up. So, Carlson and Ellis there. Let's swap them around. Do I have... How many lefties do I have? I don't have that many, huh? We are going to need an extra righty. That's okay. Uh, let's go... Hmm. Let's go with stone there. There we go. That works. It's alright. All things considered, it's okay. Do Shane there on the power play. I gotta be honest, I'm gonna take him out. I'm gonna put Gusev on the top line. I do want to put effort into this because of how important our uh, power play has been. And that penalty kill is okay. It's not bad. So let's do this. No Kevin Fiala moving forward. I had a feeling it would be the right decision to stick with a little bit of depth. Although Matej Tomek is out for a month. The Belleville Sens did win game three over Utica 1-0. It was a 1-0 shutout. Back-to-back shutouts for that team. But they have lost their starting goaltender. This series now depends, I mean, the rest of this playoff run really depends on Ian Scott to be able to get them to next month to the point where Tomek could return. However, as I've mentioned, that's not our focus. Game three, let's get this underway. We are on home ice in Ottawa. Can we take a commanding 3 nothing series lead? Let's find out. First period is scoreless for the first time in this series. Ten shots to nine in their favor. Second period is not scoreless by any stretch of the imagination. Matt Duchesne, Zach Smith, and Nikita Gusev. Three goals in under six minutes. Andre Palat gets one back with 119 to go in the period. But it's 3-1 to one on the board, 26 shots to 19 in our favor. And we are 20 minutes away from indeed having that commanding series lead. Let's go. The depth scoring has been there to make up for the fact that, you know, someone like Barzal, oh my god, Zach Smith strikes again. We're not reliant on the Barzals and the Borgstroms, whether it's Gagne, Zach Smith, or whoever else. The bottom six, and the fourth line in particular, are capable of putting up points. There's your proof. 4-1 final in game three. 40 shots to 28. It's a 3-0 lead for your Ottawa Senators. Eric Carlson with another four-assist night. Two goals for Zach Smith. And the 27-save performance for Igor Shestyorkin. Unbelievable stuff. 4-1 final. 3-0 series lead in the books. We have four opportunities to get this done. And speaking of getting it done, the Belleville sends drop game one in overtime, but win three straight over the Utica Comets. They are moving on to round two. We'll continue to follow their journey, but of course it takes a backseat to the main story, the big story here, in which it's time to find out what happens next. No changes are necessary. Game four, here at home, 60 minutes away from potentially ending this series, but we're going to have to earn it. You know they're going to fight. First period of game four, and we get the opening goal, the lone goal of the first Nikita Gusev with 140 to go, nine shots to seven in their favor. Gusev has the difference maker thus far. Second period, Hedman ties it, but it's a late surge from Ty Ronning and Colin White. It's a 3-1 lead for the Sens as we head into the third period. Let's go. Let's do this. 
18 minutes away from moving on to the next round. Can we get the job done? Colin White with his second of the game. We're seven minutes away. Dust off the brooms. Yeah, got some sweeping to do. The Ottawa Senators have swept the Tampa Bay Lightning in round one. I'm not going to call it a miracle. I'm not going to call it an upset, but it's certainly shocking. The two goal effort from White, good enough for the first star. 26 save performance from Shest Yorkin. Ty Ronning with a goal as well. 4 1 final on the board. 4 0. This series is done. It's over. It's over. The Tampa Bay Lightning, oh my Christ, have been deleted <laughs> at the hands of Eric Carlson and the Ottawa Senators. That may just be the most ridiculous scoreline I have ever seen in a four-game series. 12 points in four games. All assists. Eric freaking Carlson, ladies and gentlemen. That is unbelievable. Borgstrom, only two points. Barzal, three points, no goals. Gusev, four points, three goals. I'm okay with that. Like I said, the top line outside of Gusev is a little bit quiet. But from there, Jost, seven points for Tyson Jost. Five points for Colin White. Seven points for Mark Stone. That second line is so dangerous, so deadly, and I love it. The third line, Logan Brown, only one assist, but he's a plus five. Five points from Matt Duchesne and four points for Ty Ronning. Nothing point-wise from Paul, but he's a plus two. Three points from Zach Smith. Three points from Gagne. So again, the secondary scoring has been there. Defensively, Thomas Shabbat, two points and a plus seven. Eric freaking Carlson. 12 assists, a plus 8. Two points from Montour, a single point, the lone assist from Ryan Ellis. Nothing from Foot. One assist from Dobson. It doesn't matter. Eric Carlson and Igor Shestyorkin, along with the secondary scoring of this team, carried the weight. A 1.5 GAA, a 944 save percentage, 103 saves in those four games. Compare that, though, I do wonder, 103 saves, how much, how much puck, so to speak, that's actually the way to phrase it, I want to know how much of the puck that Vasilevsky saw, how many more saves does he have, 104, but you look at the save percentage, oh my god, is it going to tell me, yeah, it would tell me how many shots he faced, 100. And 24 shots against. Let's go back, actually. I just want to see the major difference. In terms of offensive output, the series felt even. And I just want to confirm that Vasilevsky just didn't have an answer for this offense. Let's take a look. So 124 shots against 109 for Shestyorkin. So a little bit more attention Vasilevsky's way. But nothing drastic. He just did not have an answer. The Lightning, in general, did not have an answer for this team. Despite the fact that Kevin Fiala went down to injury after the second game. He had two points in those two games. We are moving on. I'm happy to say it. We made the right call. We went out. We got Ryan Ellis. And just all in all, this team is looking Tremendous. Both teams are moving on to the second round. The only thing that's left to do for this episode is to find out who's it going to be for both the Belleville and Ottawa. Sends Belleville knows their matchup. They are taking on the Binghamton Devils in the next round. A very interesting matchup with some history there. And we're actually going to be able to go through game one. Can they get the win? 3-1 sends the 3-2 Devils, and it's a 5-2 loss in Game 1. Certainly not ideal. We'll be able to sim through Game 2 as well. Can we get the win? No, we cannot. It's an overtime loss. So the Belleville Sens have some work to do. 
the Ottawa Sens do as well as we'll be taking on the Carolina Hurricanes in the second round. We have home ice advantage. The Hurricanes pull off an upset. And that is who we'll be facing in the next round. They beat the Bruins in five. So Tampa and Boston are out. We have the Ottawa-Carolina matchup. Philly and Pittsburgh because, of course, and then over in the West, it's Minnesota-Dallas, Vegas, and Winnipeg. Some very interesting matchups outside of Mary, you know, maybe Ottawa and Carolina. Aside from the fact that, hey, we don't have to take on Boston, but just how dangerous is the Carolina Hurricanes team at this point in time? How concerned should we be? Well, fortunately, we're not going to find out until next episode. We'll take a look at their lineup then. We'll sim through that series, and hopefully our run of luck continues. I always feel a little bit paranoid about stopping a run when we're doing this well. But you got to do what you got to do. For the sake of the dramatics, you got to stop this episode now. And mainly because I got to go to bed. So I thank you guys for watching. As always, I do appreciate your support. As, of course, as I've mentioned lately, we're on the march to 10K subs. We're on the march to 10K subs throughout the course of this summer. That is the goal. You've helped me get this far. Help me make that extra step. Let's do it. Let's hit 10K before September. That's the goal. The three years on YouTube, we need to hit that 10K mark. And with the, ser uh, with the support you've shown in this series, Nations United, the Seattle series, things are looking pretty damn good. So I thank you guys for watching it again. You know what you can do to support the video and the channel beyond, of course, just watching. Subscribe, the notification bell, leave a like, all that fun stuff. All that fun stuff. Links are in, my de uh, links are in the description to my Twitter and Twitch. Self-promotion, self-promotion, self-promotion. I love you all, and I'll see you next time. Yeah. <laughs>